one hundred and fourteen are fully on means you and him will be same, no difference. If you become receptive, I don't have to come, I come here and explain things to you, somebody need not teach you how to bend, what to do, nothing. You will know everything about human mechanism, everything, from its origin to its ultimate. I love the editing. Namaste world raisers, Sabina and Roger here. Let's watch what happens if 114 chakras are activated by Sadhguru. 114 chakras? Mm -hmm. I only count seven. What is going <laughs> on? Hmm. Just kidding, I do know about the 114. We've watched enough Sadhguru videos to know, mm -hmm. but it's still going to be incredibly fascinating to learn about them. So thank you so much to our world yogi member, Diraj Sharma for this incredible request. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Namaskar uh, Sadhguru. I wanted to know um, how does the Guru transfer the yogic knowledge or information by means of transmission? The mechanics of it? The mm -hmm. mechanics of that? Oh, how is it done? Like a cordless microphone, you know. See, without being wired, you are able to transmit, you're quite capable. It's happening, isn't it? So how? See, of the 114 chakras that are there in the body, a chakra literally means a wheel, but what we are referring to is the junction points of the nadis or the energy pathways in the body. These pathways always meet in the form of a triangle, a wheel means a circle, definitely triangular, triangular wheels are more jazzy, isn't it? Would it look better? They always meet in the form of triangles, but we call them a chakra because when we see in somebody, we see it more as a circle because it's radiating a certain dimension of energy. Because it's radiating, all radiation always happens in circular form. You may throw a triangular stone into mm. a lake, still the ripples are circular, isn't yeah. it? Just like that, this may be a triangle, but when we see it, it is circular. And another thing is, it suggests movement from one dimension to another. We say it's a chakra because it takes you across. <laughs> so there are 114 chakras in the system, major chakras, there are more. Major chakras which can be worked upon are 114. Out of this 114, Two are outside the physical body, one hundred and twelve are within the body. Out of this one hundred and twelve, four, there is nothing much to do, ab do about them. That is, if you work the other things, these things will happen by themselves. They don't need any system to be worked upon. So one hundred and eight are the things that can be actually worked upon. So there are 114 systems of meditativeness. Mm -hmm. Adiyogi taught 112 different ways to realize. So when he sat down with the seven sages, the Saptarishis, he was expanding as to how the human mechanism functions. And there are 114 out of these 112. So he spoke about one hundred and twelve ways of attaining one's ultimate nature. Parvati, his wife, who was a witness to this teaching, she's already attained, but now she's a witness. She's just hanging around in the program. So she was looking at it and she said, why not more? Why only one hundred and twelve? There should be more ways. <laughs> Shiva was completely focused in what he was doing. When she said this, he just <laughs> dismissed her. He said, there are no other ways, there are only one hundred and twelve. She felt stung that in front of these seven people, he dismissed her like that. So, she said, there must be more ways, maybe you don't know. <laughs> 
He said, there are only one hundred and twelve. This impertinence, he said, leave. <laughs> so she said, I will find more ways and she went. She withdrew into the mountains and did very severe austerities and she… after many years of work, she came. Shiva was still expounding various dimensions of yoga. She came, being his wife, she could after such a long absence, she could come and sit next to him. But she came and sat down one step below to indicate that she has failed. So that's a language between the two of them, she doesn't want the seven people to know <laughs> that she failed, but she wants him to know that she has failed. So she came and sat one step below. So this story continues into various other aspects as to how she involved herself and uh, she is being used as somebody who brings doubt. He is going with such absolute power, these seven people are overawed. So she is brought in as an uncommitted observer who comes up with doubts here and there because somewhere tomorrow when it is thought, not everybody may be as committed and as focused and as receptive as the seven people were, naturally they will come up with these doubts. So she came up with these doubts which normally people would come up with. So these one hundred and eight are the things that you can work with. The remaining four just flower for you, this bonus. If you work well with hundred and eight, the other four, will happen. It's a rewarding place. The other two will anyway happen. If these one hundred and twelve have happened, the other two will anyway blossom by themselves. They are not within the physical structure of the body. So these hundred and eight, this hundred and eight is a number that is manifested in this system because of hundred and eight being a significant process or a significant number in the making of the solar system. So the diameter of the sun and the distance between the planet and the sun is hundred and eight times over. The diameter of the moon and the distance is hundred and eight mm. times. Yeah. Many ways you will see hundred and eight being a proportion in the making of the solar system. That is the reason why, otherwise maybe we would have had hundred and sixty. If suppose we were born in Mars, maybe we would have one sixty or whatever. You must check the men and see <laughs> That will check it out. The important thing about Hatha Yoga is to constantly acknowledge that this body has taken shape like this, this body has become this kind of manifestation, mainly because the way the potter's wheel is, because of the solar system, the way it is, that is why this manifestation. So Adi Yogi very clearly said, if this human body has to evolve further, some dramatic or drastic changes need to happen in the structure of the solar system. Only then the structure of the human body will change because it's reached its fullest development in terms of physical structure. Now, one can transmit effortlessly if all of this has opened up, if all the hundred and twelve are on, transmission is effortless. You want something to happen there, you don't have to go there, you can sit here and make it happen. Mm. To live a normal life, to live a full-fledged physical life, you need only twenty-one chakras. Twenty-one chakras in your body are reasonably operating, nobody will think anything wrong with you. You will be full-fledged human being. What are the remaining things about? The remaining things, if they open up, it opens up various levels of perception. It opens up dimensions of perception that suddenly people are say… people will start saying is magical or mystical, simply because different dimension of perception is opened up. Let's pause here. Mm. Do you want to give a little summary for me? <clears throat> yeah, he's just talking about, well, of course, the story with Shiva and Parvati and 
mm-hmm. Parvata giving that doubt because of course that'll arise. So yeah, so part of that, you know, story and teaching there, but came back and basically saying that no, Shiva was right, 112 yeah. right ways. Um yeah, and then the chakras. So there's 114, two are outside the body, like the higher chakras, but the rest are within. And they're nadis, right? So they're central points of the flow of the vital energy, you know, systems of the body, right? So we're more most familiar with the main seven, right? But there's mm-hmm. more than that. Um, and then, yeah, once they become activated, right, then you get into the higher mystical states, right? And I think he's just get he's going to talk more about transmission, but just the way I understood it is, yeah, an enlightened being, you enter their presence and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a meditative state just because of their field mm-hmm. of consciousness is, you know, it's expanded, right? So mm-hmm. they've transcended the barriers of their own ego bubble so that when you're entering their presence in their space, it's like you've entered their mind, right? Mm-hmm. So their field is just, It's more cosmic, the way Sadhguru is saying that you got to make your identity cosmic and then drop the limiting, you know, bubbles Mm -hmm. of your identity. And then all of a sudden, if you can do that, then you can attain enlightenment. You'll be one of these beings. And then automatically, yeah, your chakras will be activated, right? So, So I'm not sure if it's about focusing and forcing your chakras to be activated or you know, just doing the spiritual practices and then they open up on their own. But I'm sure there's various methods. So only 21 are needed to live a full-fledged life. The remaining are only about higher dimensions of perception, that you are no more human. In other people's understanding at least, you were very much human, this is human system, because most human beings do not, the majority does not flower. See, right now, the coconut trees in Tamil Nadu, I think uh, <laughs> our trees are yielding some ninety nuts per year, per tree. A better managed farm in Tamil Nadu would yield hundred and twenty, hundred and twenty-five. The same coconut tree in Kerala yields forty-five nuts to fifty nuts. The same coconut tree in Karnataka and West Bengal yields 240 to 250 nuts. It's the farming which is different. Mm. Tamil farmers, they're trying to grow coconut trees in black cotton soil thinking it's the most fertile soil. Black cotton soil is very fertile for paddy cultivation, cotton and other things, not good for coconut. Coconut needs to be grown where it is slightly… little bit of rubble in the soil. Here, if you dig, it is like toothpaste, the soil. Now, when you irrigate this land, it's very nice. Immediately, coconut tree senses life and puts out its fresh roots. When it dries, the contraction is so big in the black cotton soil, you will see it all cracked up like this. So, it will squeeze all the roots, all the tips of the roots will be crushed and it cannot grow. Every time it puts out, when it dries, it gets hurt. Every time it puts out, when it dries, it gets hurt. It needs little bit of rocky soil. You can try this. You put one little small piece of stone inside, two feet inside the earth, water it. After fifteen days you open, everything else will be dry. Just beneath the rock, there will be little bit of dampness. So always coconut tree goes and puts its tips of its roots beneath the stones because it knows always it is wet, always that will be damp and it will be protected, it will not be crushed. The same thing with a human being. A human being will not flower to his full potential unless you create an appropriate atmosphere for him, internal and external, but largely fortunately internal because we are mobile, we are not like trees, we cannot stand in one place and have the same atmosphere all the time. But there are people who do this. In India, this culture is there, this is called as Kshetra Sanyasa. Kshetra Sanyasa means we will fix a radius. Let's say here we'll fix a radius from the Dhyanalinga. We will say this much, 
he is highly energetic. So those who want to just soak in that all the time, they will take a vow that they will never leave this diameter, this radius, they will not leave and go, they will always be in that only. This is a simple intelligence, like a coconut tree, if it decides to trek up the mountain. It does very reasonably well here, but if you put him up the mountain, in one day he will be down. The wind, have you gone up the mountain? <laughs> if you go to the seventh hill, almost any season, wind will be at least like fifty to sixty kilometers. In the windy season, it will touch one hundred twenty to one hundred forty kilometers per hour. If you stand like this, it will just throw you out, it's that strong. So if this guy goes and stands there, he won't stand for an hour. So, he better stay here. But the trees are stationary, we are mobile. For us to maintain an external atmosphere, which is always conducive, is difficult. So some people take this step, which is called a Kshetra Sannyasa, they will not move out of that space. They fix a radius and just within that. So, because you want to soak in that external atmosphere, but the internal atmosphere is the most important thing for a human being as to how he keeps his interiority. That he builds a… this is called a kavacha, that you build a cocoon around yourself, a protective cocoon, wherever you go, you are in the same atmosphere as far as you are concerned. It's like you get into an airplane, it goes up thirty-five thousand feet, definitely your body wouldn't last there, but now you're in a cocoon, a pressurized chamber. Because of that, you manage. The same thing with the submarine, you wouldn't manage that pressure in the sea, but because you protect it, you manage. So like this, you create a cocoon of energy around yourself. Wherever you go, you are not a part of it, you are in your own cubicle that you're walking with. You carry your own cubicle, you don't get into anybody's space. Yeah, I just want to touch on that because that's reminded me, you know, incredibly. So me and Sabina started talking about Tibetan Buddhist deities mm -hmm. recently. And the wrathful ones especially are depicted with like a flaming ring of fire mm -hmm. around them, right? So this reminded me of that where, where, you know, you're a, you're a cosmic being and you got a cosmic mm -hmm. identity and like a, a, da, a Dakini or, you know, some other you know, deity, and then you're protected by this ring. And you can see this ring mm -hmm. of fire, like Simamuka is called the that's fire of pristine awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so that's maybe what Sakura was talking about. Oh. You have this, you have this cocoon of, okay, you've established internal well-being and you've evolved enough spiritually to understand, you know, consciousness and how to keep, you know, yourself at a higher, you know, level of like, mm -hmm you know, acceptance and joy and peace and unconditional love and mm -hmm. but but in the in the sense wrathful with the fire meaning that <laughs> nothing is gonna nothing negative is gonna enter mm -hmm. here. And anything mm -hmm. that negative that tries to is going to get burned up by the mm -hmm. you know by the fire, right? So then you can maintain your level of awareness and your, you know, attitude, you know to whatever situation arises, right? So you're bringing that into the world, no matter where you go, right? And also in Tibetan Buddhism, mm -hmm. it's like the center of the mandala. And wherever you go, the man you're always the center of the mandala and it just goes with you so that you're creating a, you know, a, a pure realm in the sense. Beautiful. So that was mm -hmm. cool. You carry your own little space wherever you go. Otherwise, you restrict yourself. But the important thing is, that all the chakras are on means you can simply transmit anything that you wish. The problem is always of receptivity. In the past I've been saying this, I have initiated more people into meditativeness, those that I have never met and seen, than people that I sit with and conduct programs with. We've conducted programs at the most for a few million people, but we have initiated many, many more people. They are meditative, but many fools do not know they can meditate. <laughs> when they sit, not for meditation, they don't even know that they must meditate. If they sit somewhere, their experience of everything is way better than others. 
but many of them still don't have the brain to understand that they are naturally becoming meditative without any effort. Somehow, and they sit down, others don't sit down, but their experience of life is way better because they're meditative in nature, because they've been initiated directly. So we can transmit this to anybody. Receptivity is the problem. To generate receptivity, there is a lot of work to do. So, you can sit here and uh, let's say you run a radio station, you can transmit in the air very easily. But if nobody has a radio, what is the use? Let's say you started transmitting a, from a radio station before Marconi came and nobody has a radio but you're transmitting and transmitting. What does it matter? Nothing happens, isn't it? So, that is always there. There is some impact of the transmission on people, even if there is no receptivity, but it is not… it does not translate into other dimensions because there is no receptivity. It is easier to transmit to rocks than to human beings. Hmm. I'm not trying to praise rocks and insult you <laughs> but uh, it's easier to transmit to rocks because certain type of rocks have the necessary physical integrity but they don't have a brain. They don't think <laughs> themselves out of things. <laughs> See, the problem with human being is largely he has thought himself out of many natural capabilities that he already had. Aren't people thinking themselves out of their joy? <laughs> Haven't they? How they were… when they were children, haven't they thinking themselves out of their joy and love and natural things that they had? So human beings are thinking themselves out. Because of that, whatever you give them, they can think themselves out. Today you teach them something, well, you have seen many of you, they come to Bhava Spandana and we blow them out. It's really a hit. Oof, everybody is hit and fantastic and dripping with ecstasy. But after six months, they will think themselves out of it. So, not everybody knows how to use their thought in a constructive manner. Largely, they're thinking about… thinking themselves out of their well-being. They were quite well when they were children. They thought themselves out. So, thought is not working always for human benefit. Most people do not know how to use it for their well-being. Largely, people are using it to work against themselves. If you activate the energy system to its fullest possibility, transmission is natural. You don't even have to go all the way. If you… if you activate sixty-three, you can transmit quite powerfully. That is the symbolism of the Tamil… Tamil culture is based mm. on sixty-three yeah. nine mars. They call them sixty-three sages who came, who transformed <laughs> Tamil culture in a big way. They brought spirituality to everybody's life. This is… one thing is those sixty-three people, maybe there were more people but for the sake of symbolism, they left those people and mentioned only sixty-three. Any temple you go, you will see small, small images of sixty-three images because mm. if you have sixty-three chakras going, we can say you are a sage, beginning to be, early sage. If you have eighty-four, you have crossed many, many limits which normally people think are superhuman. If you reach one or eight, that means you are completely there. One hundred and fourteen or fully on means you and him will be same. No difference. If you become receptive, I don't have to come… I come here and explain things to you, somebody need not teach you how to bend, what to do, nothing. You will know everything about human mechanism, everything, from its origin to its ultimate.
totally imagine getting into quite the state. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I love it when Sabina gets into the blissful states. Yeah, but this was not like blissful in the way that I would get calm, but it's more like really like <gasps> the body is getting flooded and you're getting expressive and it's like... Mm. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Anyways. So great, so great, fascinating video. And we did watch... You know some of this video. I don't. I'm not sure about the whole thing before it was a while ago. So very happy to have revisited this because, yeah. So the so the big takeaway for me in this video is that he's saying that the transmission's not really the problem, right? So there is enlightened beings in the world, like even Satguru transmitting, you know, being in his field or initiating people and transmitting, you know, planting the seeds or however you want to call it call it into the uh the seeker's mind uh the big thing is is the receptivity right are we receptive to mm. to receive the transmission he's like yeah if you got a radio station broadcasting but nobody's got a radio to receive what's being broadcast and then nothing's going to happen right so he says that it's still beneficial even if there's no receptivity because that's the you know planting yeah. the seeds and uh you know, the intention eventually for the spark of awakening, uh, perhaps, but to get into the higher states of getting those chakras activated and then full transcendence and enlightenment, like the level of sage, like a sage or a yogi, what he's talking about, or even eventually fully on, like one with Shiva, no different, just a fully realized awakened being. Yeah, we have to do the spiritual work, right? The mm -hmm. yoga and the, you know, Kriya mm -hmm. Yoga and inner engineering and whatever sort of practices we need to do to be receptive. So I do have a funny story about just my <clears throat> my intention, you know, way back years ago when I first went to Nepal, you know, on my spiritual quest. And it's like, okay, it's time. I'm seeking enlightenment and I'm going to dive into, you know, Buddhism. I have to get into the presence and the field of these enlightened beings to get this transmission and then maybe some miraculous awakening enlightenment will happen right um you know so in that first being for me to be in his presence was Lama Zopa Rinpoche right and you know the first time when he showed up at the November course and yeah so I was disappointed not <laughs> not in not in him and his and the teachings and the experience of learning the Lam Rim and everything that happened but but no, there was no sudden awakening of all of a sudden, holy, I'm enlightened now, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have the discernment to know that, okay, well, you know, we're on the path, yeah. you know, and we don't give up and you just keep on doing. And whether that is your destiny at that time or not, doesn't matter, right? Because you're open to it. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was not because of Lama Zopa. It's uh, just because, you know, Roger and Lama Zopa didn't have that link. Mm. But because when I saw Lama Zopa for the first time, mm. I had no expectations whatsoever. I just knew he was the founder of the Buddha Center that I was volunteering at. Mm. So when I went there, you know, I thought, oh, you know, great. I just, you know, watch a Lama uh, speak. And he entered the room, and I've never watched any videos or anything. I just knew the picture. Mm. And when he entered the room, I just could not believe it was. It was I never had an experience mm. like that. I had I put my hands together, and he gave talks, and they are long, like two and a half hour talks. Mm. I could not put my hands down because the energy I received from him was so strong. It was like. It was almost, I, I was protecting myself because if I would have let go, I, I wouldn't have been able to, um, hmm. like, stand this this transmission in a way. Hmm. Um, totally blew me away. I uh, spent the two days and, uh, yeah, I was never the same because it's like, wow. And I fell in love with him. And, hmm. yeah, uh, he's one of my teachers. Um, anyways, that's just interesting. You know, it's like Roger was mm -hmm. looking for it. I wasn't looking for it at all. I didn't even think that was a mm -hmm. thing. And it happens. And also just now that you talk about the receptivity, right, um, it just also reminds me of what are we 
we're talking about the last two days, maybe um, because it seems like when I watch videos, sometimes, you know, I get really into these states and maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I'm just like this open, I'm like really receptive for it. And that's why mm -hmm. so many videos really touch me, you know, and make me so emotional. And mm -hmm. um, maybe that, that is why, and maybe you're yeah. not like that receptive. Yeah, um, it could be. And, yeah. I, and I'm aware of it too, just because my path is more intellectual, right? So mm. conceptual knowledge. And then of course there's the teachings that eventually that needs to be let go and dropped. So, so of course, so opening up and becoming more, you know, vulnerable to just be and absorb, you know, the presence and the energy, you know, without trying to intellectually understand it, right? Yeah, because so. I think that is one thing. I, and I was at that stage too, where there was nothing I received for years, because I thought I figured it all out, right? It's like, I have all this knowledge, I know what I didn't, yeah, but I was at a very high level of pride. Um, I figured it all out, you know, everything I hear is like, yeah, I heard before, I know what the path is about. And so I was not receptive at all. So maybe, I don't know, just going back to the beginner's mind, I don't know how it, how it works for an intellectual mm -hmm. that knows everything, but almost like dropping into the heart maybe you know yeah. from like tony robbins <laughs> from the head to the heart to stop stop intellectualizing just yeah. just being there and i don't know it's like faith and devotion yeah. almost like just like almost like a child you know let's watch this and without being in the head but being in the heart and just yeah. being receptive and not because mm -hmm. uh, when you're in your head you're dead Tony Robbins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyways, the teachings are all coming together. Wow. Uh, you know, we're on the path. We are <laughs> seekers on the path together. And we're so fortunate mm -hmm. to have you guys with us, um, oh. you know, to be inspired and to go for it and to really commit ourselves. Right. So our hardcore, you know, viewers, the ones that are watching us all the time, mm -hmm. like this is a, mm -hmm. this is a journey. This is a ride, you know, like we're, there's nothing else <laughs> worth doing on this planet in reality than evolving spiritual because we're all going to die someday. So what mm -hmm. else is there really to do? Um, yeah. Okay. So then, so the title of the video just, yeah, because we were getting away from, so transmission and receptivity that was more the discussion yes. that mm. that he was having but in the sense but wrapping up with what happens when they're activated so the crux of that myth met uh message there is just yeah you're one with shiva one <laughs> like a fully realized awakened being mm. once once mm. they're all activated um and that'll happen naturally as we practice and uh, yeah. evolve and become more receptive right and then get these initiations and these transmissions, and then we can evolve spiritually for the benefit of all. So we're raising our level of consciousness by seeking that and being open to that. And then our level of consciousness helps raise the level of the field. So that's what it's all about. So uh, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for this request. Um, if you like this video as much as we did, please hit that like button. Remember to subscribe. It really, really helps the channel. Let us know what you think down in the comments. Uh, what sort of spiritual practices are you doing to become more receptive um, <laughs> on the journey, on the path? Yeah, please share. We love hearing from you. Mm -hmm. And remember, raise yourself. And raise the world. Thank you so much, everyone. And a very special... Thank you to our world yogi, Diraj Sharma. We love you. Peace.